first 12 verses of this because we want to celebrate. This is Easter Sunday. This is the day we celebrate the resurrection. Of course, one of the kind of funny things about it, we talk about, well, last Easter this and last Easter. It's, one of the, it's a floating holiday. It's always on a different Sunday. Uh, for example, we have some, some friends, and he is a pastor, and today is also their wedding anniversary. As one of the kids said, they got married on Easter? I said, well, no, they, they didn't. And in fact, you know, that's really not a smart move for preachers. There's certain times of the year aren't good times for preachers to get married. Easter and Christmas really fall into those. Our anniversary is six days before Christmas. But, uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's... Nobody ever accused most preachers of being smart. That's really not, not one of the things that we get accused of. But it kind of bounces around. But, so it's really the day that we celebrate when Jesus is risen. We can kind of look back at the calendars and take a guess as to which year it actually happened. And so if we do that, then we can figure from that what day it actually uh, the, the resurrection actually occurred. But we don't know for certain. In the same way, we don't really know for certain when Jesus was born. We celebrate December 25th because that's our best guess. Uh, and so we celebrate Easter. And it, Easter always falls, in case you've ever wondered, Easter always falls on the Sunday after the first full moon after the spring, uh, the, the spring equinox. And if that doesn't confuse you a little bit, realize that the that different people across the years in the church that actually became one of the fights in early church history. Uh, and one of the uh, the books, old dusty books, to bore you all with this for just a minute, that, that made one of my favorite people from early church history famous was his book about how to figure the date of Easter so that you would always know when Easter was supposed to be. And he actually wrote uh, what was called a computus, which was a a method of calculating Easter so that you could always know when Easter would be. Uh, and that made him famous, basically. That He wrote the history of England uh, in the 700s when there hadn't been that much history to write. It would take a lot more now to write it. But Luke chapter 24 is that first Easter, that first day when the resurrection came. So Luke chapter 24, when you find that, if you would stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. Luke writes here, he says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. That they is going to be the women who will get their name in, names in just a minute. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. But he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, had returned from the tomb, and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you'll speak to us by this your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We look at this, and we see something here that the disciples and their first reaction to Easter was to look at the women who came and told them this and say, well, y'all are just basically crazy. You're you're speaking nonsense. You've lost your minds. When they say that, when, when they look at that, when Luke records here, these words appeared to them as nonsense. These words appeared to the disciples that Jesus is not in his tomb, that they had seen a couple of angels who told them that Jesus was risen. He says, this, this is, they said, this is nonsense. This is the babbling that crazy people do. Back in those days, you had crazy people just like you have now. You have people that just talk and talk and talk and never say anything. It sounded as nonsense. And yet, it was not nonsense. In fact, it was the greatest news that had ever been proclaimed. It was the best thing that we could ever hear. And yet, even to the disciples, it appeared as nonsense. Yet, how do we know? How do we know that this is worth knowing? How do we know that the, the greatness of the 
story of Easter? Well, first of all, we should look at the statement here that the, the, that the angel speaks. He says, remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, that this would happen. When the storms and the trials and the difficulties and the frustrations of life come around us, one of the first things that we need to remember is what he has already said. We need to remember the promises of Jesus. We need to remember the things of the Word of God in the dark times and the confusing times when we get up and the world around us is still sleeping and our hope seems to be dead. All that we have given our lives to seem to be just pointless and lost. We look at these women that are here, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James, and Joanna. In other places, Joanna is actually the wife of the steward of Herod. She's probably caused some pretty serious family tension by being a part of the followers of Jesus. And even if it hasn't been tension within her family, she's caused her family some difficulty. If her husband has been in agreement with her following Jesus as she has, Herod has not been very supportive. Think of what she has lost and sacrificed and given up that, that she could be a part of walking with Christ. And yet he's dead. There's nothing left. There's no hope. It's dark. It's early in the morning. The sun's just beginning to come up. And she goes to the tomb and he's not even there. But what they're reminded of is to remember, he already told you that this would happen. Folks, we face strange and uncertain times, and we always will. That's not really a comment on the nature of society right now, more than it is just a comment on human nature. <coughs> the world is an unpredictable place. Last year, by the time we hit Easter, most of the farmers that I asked had already planted everything and were starting to worry about whether they'd get enough rain on their crops to make it grow. Now if you ask a farmer or two how things are going, and they, they don't even want to talk about water. They don't want to think about rain right now. They certainly don't want to think about how easy it was to get everything planted last year. The world is an uncertain place. Things change. Times change. Sometimes they change for the better. Sometimes they change for the worse. But all the time there is uncertainty in this world around us. And guess what? If we look at the words of Jesus, we know that he said that those times would come. He said that there would be difficulties, that there would be natural disasters, that there would be economic problems, that there would be international conflicts. Right now, the, the biggest, one of the biggest concerns in the world is the fact that the, the leader of North Korea has been talking a big, a big deal about how strong and powerful and wonderful his army is. And the fear is that he won't be able to back down away from that without trying to show off to somebody. He's like the schoolyard bully that talks and talks and talks and then ends up getting himself into a fight just to try to prove that he can. And that's a concern. That's something worth worrying about. This is a man who thinks that using a nuclear weapon on Austin, Texas is a good idea. We live in uncertain times. We have these difficulties. And the Lord told us that these would come. We look to Scripture. He has said that this type of thing will happen. But He's also promised that He would be with us. And in fact, at Easter, we're able to remember why it is that He can be with us. Unlike so many other religions, so many other belief systems, so many other thoughts and ideas... Instead of having to say, well, we've at least got the writings of our prophets and we've at least got the, the, the memories of our teachers and we've got the songs of our singers and we've got this and this and we have all of these records, we can say this. We know that Jesus is alive. And that when He promises us at the end of Matthew that lo, He is with us always, even to the uttermost parts of the earth, even to the farthest ends of the age, we can remember that He is alive and He's able to deliver that promise. 
He didn't promise us what someone else would do. He didn't promise us what, what God would do, that He wouldn't deliver Himself. He promised us Himself. And so we gather as a church today to remember His words and remember that He is alive and with us, not that we are on our own. Not that if we forget to, to, to remember who God was and what God has done, that everybody else will forget. But to remember that even if we do forget who God is, He's still there. And it's for us to remember that we do serve a risen Savior and a living Savior. This is not a day that we gather at the gravesite of our Lord and Savior to weep and to mourn, but we gather to say, well, we think this might have been where Jesus was possibly buried because we don't know. And we'll never be certain. Because He is risen. Not because He's there. And no matter how strange or confusing or dark the times get around us, we can rely on His Word because if He can deliver when He promised that if He went to the cross and died that He would rise again, if He promised and delivered that, then everything else is a cinch. Think about that. Almost every one of us, when we make promises or we make commitments, we have certain things that we say in the back of our minds that people will understand if we're not able to deliver if this happens. If I tell Jeanette that I'll be here Wednesday night to help with, with things in the kitchen for Feed the Flock, I, I assume that she understands that certain things might get in the way of that, and, and it's not really a broken promise. It's just sometimes things stop us from delivering. If I, you know, I hate to even say it, but I, I would assume that she would realize that if I were to die between now and Wednesday, that I'm not going to be there. That would stop me from delivering on that promise. But here's the truth. There is no promise that Jesus can't deliver on because not even death can keep him from his promises. Everything he said we can trust. Everything he promised we can know that he will fulfill because even death itself cannot stop him. And death can stop every last one of us. Because we can close our eyes today and open them in, in eternity and we wouldn't be able to finish out the things we thought we'd do. But that won't stop the Lord Jesus Christ. The angels give a challenge to the, to the women as they come to the tomb. They say this, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? I've always loved that line. That's one of my favorite lines in the Easter story. Why do you seek the living one? Why are you wasting your time here? That's a question worth reflecting on. Why do we waste our time on dead things? Why do we waste our time seeking life among the dead things? We seek our insp inspiration and encouragement from a dead world instead of from a living Savior. We seek our, our plans and our future and our goals in life among the dead materials of this earth. Point our children towards heroes that serve dead idols. When we should point everything towards the living one instead of seeking the living among the dead. Our goal is not to find the living among the dead. Our goal as God's people is to go among the dead and raise those back to life by, the, by spreading the gospel that Jesus will work through us to see the dead become the living. But beyond that, we can't find the living among the dead. Why do we look? Why do we spend our time on the things and our effort on the things that have already died and that will never come back to life? We can store up, stock up, pile up, load up, and when it comes to the end of the day, everything that was dead and useless was, is still such. Why do we seek the living among the dead? In fact, what we should do before we worry about anything else is go and proclaim that Jesus is risen.
The angels look at the, at the ladies and they say, Go. Go tell his disciples. He says, Go do this. Go and report all these things. They go and report all these things to the eleven and all the rest. They go back to the upper room. They go back into Jerusalem. And they find the people that they have followed Jesus with. And they say, Look. Guess what we were told? He's not in the tomb. And he's alive. Jesus is risen. What fills our lips and fills our minds? What becomes the passionate idea behind us that we want to tell people? We could spend all of our time rattling off, well, these are the teams. These are the teams that have made the final four. Here's how my bracket is done. We won't talk about how my bracket is done. Let's just say there's a reason that I don't gamble for a living. It just doesn't work. I'm coming in last in my office bracket pick I'm the only person in my office. <laughs> but plants did better than I did this year in picking basketball teams. But we could brag and say, well, this is what we've done. Turn on the radio every day and I hear people, I hear that they're talking about how, well, this is who we've recruited for our football team and this is what our plans are for our basketball team. This is how our baseball team is doing it. Glorious day tomorrow because baseball season starts back up. We finally get back to the great sport. And these things could fill our words and could fill our time. We could spend our time proclaiming how much we like the president, how much we dislike the president, how much we like this politician, we don't like that politician. We could spend all of our time talking about how good of a deal we found when we were out shopping yesterday, how great of a vacation we were planning, how good of this has gone or that has gone. We spend our time dissecting whether the news report on Wednesday that we were out of corn was right, or the news report on Thursday that they found 400 million extra bushels that somebody had just displaced. Yet to figure out how you lose 400 million bushels of corn. Apparently, yeah, it's possible. All of these things we could spend our time talking about and arguing about, and yet the greatest news of the world should be on our lips more than anything else. That Jesus is alive. That forgiveness of sins is possible. That a relationship with the living God is possible. That we can gather as a church not to come and to weep and to mourn and to, to think about all the things that have gone wrong, but to celebrate that the greatest thing ever has gone right. Not to come and to think about how things could be and oh, how only this and if only that, but instead to come and say, praise God. The truth is, we serve a living God. We don't come to remember the dead, but we come to celebrate the life of Christ. We come to remember His life, His living, His death for our sins, and His resurrection for our, that shows our forgiveness. And we need to remember that. We need to be reminded of that. So often when you, when you start to, to feel yourself begin to kind of turn downward and start looking at all of the problems and all the difficulties and all the things in this world, you know what you need to be reminded of? <coughs> death couldn't hold the Lord. And if death can't hold, hold your Lord and your Savior, nothing else can either. Death couldn't hold Jesus. Death can't hold him. Nothing else will hold him. Nothing else can stop him. And nothing can pull you down. And then there's people that need to know that. We need to be reminded of it. And there's people that don't know it. There's people that think that there's no real difference between all the various religions of this world. Well, they're all, you know, they're all mostly right or partly right or totally wrong. You know, why would you go to church anyway? Why would you do this? Why would you spend your life with that? Well, if Jesus isn't alive, I don't know why we do it either. But since He is, that's why we do. Since He is, that's why we gather. But we have to be prepared for this. The world's going to call us crazy. We need to realize that. You're going to be considered a little bit on the crazy side. You really think that happened? You really think that they nailed him to a cross? He hung there for hours. 
Do you really think that he was able to, as he, as he hung there, instead of being angry or frustrated or bothered by all the people around him, that he was able to cry out to God for the forgiveness of the people that were there? Do you really think that they were able to put him in a tomb, that the Romans got it right that he was dead, but they couldn't get it right to seal up the tomb to keep anybody from letting him out? Don't you think that maybe something else happened? Maybe the disciples managed to sneak in and steal his body. Maybe they forgot where he was actually buried. Maybe, maybe just, you know, it's all just a lie made up to, to give some people power and control over your lives. You, don't you think that something else is going on here? Are you just crazy to believe this? You've never seen it. To be ready for the world to hit us with all of those things at once and a thousand more. Because it sounded like nonsense to the disciples, too. Until Peter gets up and starts running down the road and goes and sees. It seems like nonsense to the disciples until as they're gathered there in the upper room and the door's locked, they look up and there stands Jesus. And he says, Peace be with you. Seems like nonsense until they see for themselves and know for themselves that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And to the world around us, it'll sound like nonsense. It'll sound like we've lost our ever loving minds. Do we think that there is a God who came, lived, died, and rose again? Nothing else is more important to us than that. And you know what? We ought to let them think that we're crazy. Rather than spending our time and our effort to persuade them that we're not, spend our time and our effort to persuade them that He is in fact alive. Because until they see that, they'll still think it's nonsense. But I will stake my life my eternity on the blessed nonsense of the resurrection of Jesus. Because nothing else can give us hope when we face the death of a loved one. Nothing else can give us hope when we face the chaos of the world. Nothing else can give us hope when we face our own mortality. Nothing else can give us hope when we face the darkness and the depth that is our sin and our separation from God, but to know that He who promised us is faithful, that He who promised us is able, and that He who promised us is alive. It's a beautiful story, and it's a true story. And it's the greatest thing that we can know, that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather here. We thank you, Lord, for the grace and the mercy and the blood of Christ. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to follow you well. It's in Jesus' name.